Hi everybody, and welcome to Once Upon a Scarf. This channel is all about great vintage scarves and the wonderful stories they tell. This video was originally to be about how barking mad, okay, yelling mad, this vintage 50s scarf is. At once absolutely gorgeous and absolutely terrifying. But then I started digging deeper, and the story took a rather stunning turn. Stay tuned for a tale about a notoriously independent animal and a notoriously independent artist, possibly meeting up behind me on a square meter of silk. I'm the author of two classic books on vintage fashion, Secondhand Chic and It's Vintage Darling. I'm a huge fan of the luxury, affordability, and in this case, bombshell revelations behind vintage scarves. I'm so happy to share what I know with you. Let's be honest, this scarf takes no prisoners. It exists, as far as I know, in two versions. Mine, the one behind me, is signed Denise Francel. This was a shop which served gloves, hats, and other accessories to elegant ladies along the Rue de Rivoli in Paris until 2011, and is now on the Rue Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The other iteration, shown here, is signed Baccarat, which was one of the great Lyonnaise silk houses producing scarves for the top designers in France through the 20th century. It seems like they liked this scarf so much, they issued it under their own name and then issued it to Francel's shop or vice versa. The precise timeline is unknown, but I'll guess the scarf dates from somewhere in the late 1950s to the mid 1960s. What do we have here? A fantastic portrait of two Persian cats. Indeed, it is entitled Persan, with meticulous, you might even say slightly fanatic detailing of fur and whiskers, and eyes that simply don't let you go. Such is the kerpow factor here, that it seemed to have spawned some imitations. To get to its true heart and possible true origins, we have to shift back several decades to 1931, when a 17-year-old, half-Italian, half-Argentinian artist and wild child named Lenore Feeney arrived in Paris. Even before then, she had had an incredible background. It's a bit too intricate to go into here, but I've put a link to her bios in the information box. Even as a teenager, she was prepared to plunge headfirst into Bohemian Paris. She made friends with the artists the Max Ernst, Picasso, Dali, de Chirico, and so many more. She became a painter, entirely self-taught, and a very skilled one at that. She exhibited alongside the Surrealists, but never adopted that label, and significantly had her first one-person show in Paris when she was 25 at a gallery directed by none other than Christian Dior. Feeney was a force of nature, and that's shown through her art. The gallery that currently has custody of her work, Weinstein, calls her the most ferociously and heroically independent woman artist of the 20th century. Wow. When you've got Georgia O'Keeffe, Frida Kahlo, and Diane Arbus in that lineup, among countless others, that is very high praise indeed. Many of Lenore Feeney's paintings featured women in positions of power or in very sexualized situations. An example of this is the painting La Boue du Monde, The End of the World. Here a woman is submerged in water up to her breasts with human and animal skulls surrounding her. But of course, she was an artist in interwar Paris, and that meant a degree of starvation. To make ends meet, she started taking on design projects in the 1930s as a source of extra income. Between 1944 and 1972, Feeney's main gigs were costume designs for films and stage productions, and a huge amount of fashion illustration. She worked for Elsa Schiaparelli, another force of nature, and designed the bottle for the perfume Shocking. Shocking might well have described Feeney's unconventional living arrangements. Marriage never appealed to me, she said. I've never lived with one person. Since I was 18, I've always preferred to live in a sort of community, with a man who is rather a lover, 
and another who was rather a friend. And it has always worked. So why am I telling you about this under-recognized mid-century artist who managed to make her menages work? First, because she's fabulous. And second, because she had one other fascination besides women and power and sex. She was also, and I don't put this mildly, obsessed with cats. Later in life, she employed an assistant to join her household, which he described as a little bit of a prison and a lot of theater. One of his jobs was to look after her beloved Persian cats. Over the years, she had as many as 23 of them. They shared her bed and were allowed to roam the dining table at mealtimes. She painted, drew, and celebrated them obsessively. This was both as adjuncts to female sexuality and as gorgeous creatures in their own right. In every way, cats are the most perfect creatures on the face of the earth, she said, except that their lives are too short. According to one source, her unsigned works have been identified by Persian cat hairs attached to the pigment or scratches on the canvas. So, did a crazy cat lady design this scarf? That's kind of crude and much too dismissive. A crazy genius Pathfinder cat lady may have designed this scarf. I repeat, may. We don't know. It's not signed. There are sadly no cat hairs attached, real ones at least. But when we look at this scarf, it's useful to remember the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea of why cats are such great symbols of liberty. Why? Because cats are resistant to the tyranny of domestication. Doesn't that sound familiar? Anyway, if this guess is true, this may be one of the greatest of many, many, many cat portraits Leonor Fini ever produced. And they still show up with some regularity on the second-hand market. If I were you and I saw one, I wouldn't pause. And that's today's scarf story. I hope you enjoyed it. This channel is all about education. No affiliate links or sales hype attached. Please press the usual buttons if you'd like to see more.